Um, if you have a Bible with you, in the New International Version, it's page 1115. Um, if it's a New Living Translation, it's page 848. This is the Church Bibles only. Okay. So NIV is page 1115, and the New Living Translation is page 848. And we're continuing on from where we left off, left off a couple of weeks ago. Um, just before I start, though, I'd like to say to you, I did intimate that I was going to um, maybe spend a few weeks in Acts and then go on to do a series in Ruth. But because I'm going on holiday in June, uh, I realised with Pentecost and everything else, it's going to be a bit higgledy-piggledy. So what I'm going to do is carry on in Acts until I go on holiday. And then when I get from hol back from holiday, I've got a, a good run at it. Okay, so um, I promise it'll only be about five weeks. Okay, well, ish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to give you that in writing at all, but um, yeah, I mean it's great. I'm looking. I'm really looking forward to. I've been doing some work, and I'm looking forward to it. But um, I can't resist um, the Book of Acts at all, and you'll know that from the time we've spent already in Acts. I've been here. Actually, it was two years this week, um, and um, I think we spent most of our time in the Book of Acts. But that's because it's a, it's formalizing for us. It's important for us to understand where the church began and what it's meant to be. And that, the more and more we read about Acts and the, the exploits of the apostles, we realize just how much we lack. And it's not just a cultural lacking. It's something to do with our, our natural reserve. But maybe it's a British thing, I don't know. And we're a little bit frightened to let God have his way. But I think if we were to allow God to have his way, we'd be in for a, a few surprises. Now we've read the, the story, um, haven't we, um, about the sons of Sceva and uh, I always smile when the demon jumped on them, gave them a good beating and then they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. That always makes me laugh. I don't know if it's because of the image of people running naked down the street or whether it's because they thought they were doing something and actually the demon identified them for who they actually were. But it was that kind of a reminder to them and to us that God knows who his disciples are, and so does the devil. Okay. Let me tell you about revival. Gypsy Smith, there was a man called Gypsy Smith a lot of years ago who was a great evangelist, and he was once asked what the secret to revival is. And he said, well, go home and get a piece of chalk and draw a circle around yourself and then say this, ask the Lord to revive everything within the circle. Revival, you see, is the visitation of God which brings life to Christians who have been sleeping and it restores a deep sense of God's near presence and holiness. From this springs a vivid <coughs> sense of sin, a profound exercise of the heart in repentance, in praise and in love. And then there is evangelistic outflow. Every Revival movement has its own distinctive features, of course, but the pattern is the same every time. First of all, God comes. On New Year's Eve, 1739, John Wesley, George Whitfield and some other friends held a love feast, um, which became a, a watch night of prayer to see the new year in. A lot of Christians do that. And at about three o'clock in the morning, Res Wesley wrote down, the power of God came mightily upon us, insomuch that many cried out for exceeding joy and many fell to the ground. Revival, you see, always begins with a restoration of the sense of the closeness of God. How many prayer meetings have you been to and that's happened? Second, the gospel is loved as never before. The sense of God's nearness, it, it just creates an overwhelming awareness of our own sin and our own sinfulness. And so the power of the cleansing blood of Christ is suddenly greatly appreciated and then our repentance deepens and deepens. Did you know in 1920 revival, in the 1920s in Ulster, ship, shipyard workers who had turned to Christ brought back so many stolen tools that the new sheds had to be built to for the recovered property. You see, repentance results in restitution. And finally, the Spirit works fast. Godliness multiplies. Christians mature. And then, converts appear. 
You know what, Jan's funeral a couple of weeks ago, this place was full, wasn't it? It was an amazing experience. And I really got to thinking, if the converts were starting to appear and we filled this church up completely, how would we cope? Well, we would cope because if revival came and the presence of God was there, we wouldn't be thinking about how we cope. God would help us to cope. But I have to ask you another question, and it's a personal question to every person. When was the last time you led someone to Christ? Don't put your hands up, okay? I don't want answers on a postcard. But let me just say to you, you know, being present when folk trust Christ, you see a change in their life. Often it's immediate and it's it's remarkable. Because when that happens, we see and experience the power of God over evil. We witness the breaking of the chains of sin and the promise of a real future. And I don't have the words for just how incredible that is, but its impact is so often missed by the church today. And maybe that's why there isn't an excitement anymore. And I have to say, it really disturbs me that the activity of God the Holy Spirit is marginalised to the point so that the presentation of the church and the media is on the extreme. So we, get, we were talking about this at lunch the other day. You either get a picture on the TV, something like Songs of Praise, you know, it'll be a, a traditional sort of worship, pews, gothic surroundings and, and, and formal hymns. Or then you go to another extreme and there's folk who are really casual, you know, just like us in their jeans and things, and it's great, but they're swinging off the chandeliers. And then you go to another extreme and you've got, a ba- it's like a rock concert and the band have got centre stage. See, we understand the emotion of worship. I get the ecstasy of worship. I see the formality of worship. But where is the power of God, the Holy Spirit? Where is the place in the performance that is worship for us to see the demonstration of his power and the transformation of the lives of the congregation? So the question that has to be asked is, do we really know what we're looking for? in our discipleship, in our worship, in our Bible reading, in our prayer, in our life in general? Do we know what we're really looking for? What is your priority there? And I had, I had a friend, he's in heaven now, but he, he was in the centre of revival. I've told you a story before. And he's just said to me, Bob, when you've experienced that, nothing else will do. Let me tell you a story. When I was uh, an army scripture reader years ago, I was on a week's training down in Aldershot, and we went to this barracks one night, uh, me and my colleague, and he said, I've got a visit here. It was about six, seven in the evening. He said, I've been asked to drop off some New Testaments to the office. I said, okay. He said, why don't you just pop in there and visit some of the lads? I said, yeah, right, I'll do that. So I popped into this room. Of course, they all stand to attention. I said, oh, just relax, boys, you know, how are we doing? And I was asked to come over to one of the bed spaces And the pictures, you had to be a gynaecologist to understand the pictures, and it was terrible, all over these dirty pictures, all over this wall. And uh, I went up to the lad, and I said, oh, some interesting artwork going on here. And he he said, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, and he started talking about his pictures. And then someone said, and what's worse, he reckons he's a Christian. And I said, oh, really? And it turned out this lad was backsliding. He'd actually given up his commitment to Christ. So I sat on his bed and we started talking and he recommitted his life to Christ there and then and he took all these pictures down and put them in the bin. Wonderful, you might say. But because he did that, one of his friends said, what's just happened here? So he asked questions and then another one of his friends came over and they asked and before I knew it, there were lads coming in the room. Someone had gone out and told them. And by the time my colleague turned up an hour later, there was a queue of lads, and we're talking boys from, si- from 18 to 20, all the way down the corridor waiting to come in and hear what I had to say. That was nothing to do with me. That was the power of the gospel. And many lives were changed that night. We didn't leave till midnight. My friend had turned up and he, my colleague came up and said, what is going on? I was just dropping some Bibles off. I said, sorry, I'm going nowhere. And he said, just a minute, I'll go to the other corridor. So he went to another corridor and the same happened for him. And we spent all night 
talking to young men and sharing the gospel of Christ. We saw lives changed and revolutionised their night. And I have to tell you, when that happens, nothing else will do. The last time we considered that regardless of our spiritual teaching, our take on the divine, Jesus offers us a chance at reality. But if we're going to take it on, we have to walk in reality and we have to stop faking it. Whenever the gospel story is told by word or by action, it's extremely difficult not to become aware of the momentous events that are taking place in which there is intense conflict. And as we consider the response of the demons to the sons of Sceva, there was this fear that spread like wildfire in the community and they realised that something more powerful had arrived, arrived and they had no control over that. These folk have been kidding themselves on that the practice of their religious and occult activities, they were the ones who were the influencers. That they were the ones with the power to control other people's lives. You see, up until now, they could pick and choose from this spiritual smorgasbord that was available to them. They could even design their own religion so they didn't have to take any risks. That way everyone's happy. That way there's no conflict. Just an opportunity to keep your head down and to blend in. And every single one of them resisted change. And this incident, though it caused a real stir, and I think we can assume that all the healings that had happened previously, despite the theft from Paul's workshop, when we talked about the handkerchiefs, the cloths around his head, his aprons, they were been pinching these, and there was a healing from those things. And I said that God had allowed these things to happen so that these folk would take notice. Now these people are taking notice. Here's your first heading, the size of the problem. The scripture becomes all the more real as we look forward to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, where we read that we struggle not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. And as we, as we read this, we become aware of this cosmic battle that is raging between the forces of good on one hand, the forces of evil on the other hand, between God and the very devil himself. Today, in our very sophisticated society, to speak of God as personal or of evil in terms of a devil or Satan, well, that just cries is, raises cries of disbelief at the naivety of the Christian faith. And there's even some church groups that have this attitude. There's a denial of the spiritual, and there's a fear that we might lose control. And this, of course, is largely down to bad teaching. And a reaction to a, a theological formalism that lives in categories rather than understanding that the frameworks that exist have been designed to help us to understand the mind of God better, but they are not there as a sole means of deciphering and implementing biblical truth. Because of the lack of willingness to dig deeper or face the reality of spiritual truth in the heavenly realms, the church in large part has been rendered absolutely impotent in so many areas because it's allowed Satan in. And of course he loves every minute of that, doesn't he? He draws our focus away from Jesus. He draws our focus away from the potential that we might have if we're living for him. And he enhances his own agenda. And as we continue to draw on that same spiritual smorgasbord as the Ephesians did here in Acts, we open ourselves up to all kinds of error and especially distraction. One writer says, the thoroughly evil nature of the devil consists in the fact that here we have spontaneous, self-generating sin expressed in pure defiance and pure arrogance. The devil is not impersonal like stones or bureaucracies. He is a non-person. The devil has become all that God is not. He's not beyond personality. He is without it. His purpose in creation is not to destroy God. He knows he can't do that. He wants to draw us into the vortex of non-personhood that he has become 
and the nothingness of non-being that he is becoming. Satan, in short, aims to take as many of us with him as he can. That's the size of the problem. Here's your next heading. Darkness and light. Now here in the Acts story, the power of God had a remarkable effect. Let's look at verse 18 together. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the, va- the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. A drachma is about the day's wages. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. If you're being paid £150 a day, 150000 I'm not going to try and, try and work that out. I'm not very good at maths. We're talking about a lot of people. We're talking about a lot of money here. And as folks start believing, it's as if someone has turned a light on and everything that, that doesn't sit right suddenly is exposed. And as these folks begin to clean up their lives and reveal some of the practices that they'd been involved in, others saw that and they were attracted to that same freedom that was on offer to them. The practice of astrology, astrology and horoscopes, the involvement in witchcraft and spiritualism with its so-called communication with the dead. All of these things are just commonplace today and we're told that they're absolutely harmless. They are not harmless. Now here in the story, these folk had no idea that by opening the door to this spiritual filth, they had corrupted themselves and then in turn had corrupted the society around them. And the same is true today. The only problem, of course, was that once the door is ajar, every wrong influence finds its way in. This is why they were weak and fearful. This is why they were upset and distressed within themselves. Well, the change in their lives triggered another movement. Look at verse 19. A number who practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. I don't know if that puts you in mind of another scripture. But um, I was reading Colossians chapter 2 here, it says, and uh, verse 13, it says here, When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. I wonder when Paul wrote that, he was actually thinking about what happened here in Acts chapter 19. Here we have a real wow moment in the story. Here's the perfect illustration of the difference between darkness and light. And you know, whenever I read this, I'm reminded of John's Gospel, when Jesus made that statement in John chapter 8, when he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And the context here, of course, is the magnificent surroundings of the temple at the Passover in Jerusalem. There wouldn't be just a party atmosphere. Everyone would be focused upon God and his goodness. And this produced a desire for the community to worship. It was for those that were there the presence of God and now Jesus in the centre of all of it draws attention to himself and speaks of the answer that the Father has provided in him. Just as the great lamps have been lit to demonstrate the light of God had lit up a huge area, Jesus stands up and says, I'm the light of the world that will provide illumination, not just for physical sight but for a sight beyond the sight. The symbolism that is involved in all of this is incredible. Bringing together the history of the wilderness wanderings at the Exodus from Egypt, where they were guided by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And this image would be in the forefront of their minds during that celebration as they were spending time thinking about the journey that the people had been on with their their God. And now this invitation from Jesus, and he says... 
I'll be a guiding light, an enduring light, a point of focus and devotion to everyone who follows me. And here's the perspective. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now we must take these si- oh. we must take these words seriously because Jesus always means what he says. These are not empty politicians' promises like those that we hear all the time. Promises that conveniently are forgotten at the election. When Jesus speaks, he means to fulfil what he says. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, not just knows me, but trusts me, will have light in his or her pathway. Okay, so scripture test. Psalm 119, 105 says what? Thy word is a light to my path. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. And the pilgrim's response in verse 106 Oh, it's funny, isn't it? We've got all these memory verses, eh? So, the next verse says, I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. The invitation is timeless and is grasped with both hands by the folks in Ephesus here in chapter 19 of Acts. So much is their desire to know more and be free, they bring out all of the resources that they have for tapping evil. And they burn them publicly. And it all kicked off when a demon was irritated by a group of self-seekers using Jesus' name for their own ends, and he gave them a hiding. This reveals the fact that even the demons are in awe of Jesus Christ, and they know who his disciples are. Now sometimes it's best just to trust God, the Holy Spirit, to get on with his work. And I find it fascinating that after all of this had happened, that's exactly what happened with the Apostle Paul. If you look at verse 21. After all this had happened, it's almost like some run-of-the-mill thing, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I'd been there, he said, I must visit Rome as well. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. Now, at first glance, it seems a little bit offhand, actually. Uh, After seeing all the movement of the Spirit, folk responding so well, and so many people had a new start in life, on the surface, we're asking Paul, what are you doing? They need leadership now. They need your teaching now. In verse 21 it says, after this happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem. It's interesting, if you were to read the Greek there, it speaks of a decision made in the Spirit. Actually, God is guiding Paul to go and work someone else, somewhere else. And clearly, he's got plenty of resources in Ephesus to carry on the work of the Gospel. And I think that's so important for the church to understand. In the midst of all that is going on, Paul is redirected by God to fulfil another part of his plan. You see, we must never feel that we or anyone else is indispensable. That is a mistake of darkness. And you've got to remember the graveyard is full of indispensable people. Here we have the demands of a call from God as he brings light into our soul and our humble response. There's nothing we need more in our world today the light on our path, because people are walking in darkness. World systems are failing because there is no light. Instead, there's just a justification of actions and it's dressed up as light. And we're conned into thinking that righteousness is not an objective. Rather, humanity now believes that we are masters of our own destiny. If Acts 19 were our starting point, We've just come full circle, haven't we? Jesus and his gospel pose for so many people a real problem. He challenges empty religion. He challenges questionable spiritual practices right to their core. And in the exposure of their emptiness, Jesus reveals the work of Satan that attempts to undermine the liberating truth of God 
so denying the people the reality and power of faith. But God has got it all in hand. And we'll continue next time. Shall we pray?